So I, I think the, uh, the exhibition downstairs shows what's possible in manufacturing technically. I think we in this state now got really got to look about how we take that and take that opportunity into real manufacturing practice, uh, helping companies, building new economies, new industries, and so on. So I want to get the panel to focus their minds on that sort of thing. And I'm going to start with, I guess, the generic question, um, particularly given that at least two of us, or three of us even, are associated with government in this case. Uh, what levers can be pulled, starting with Mark, at policy or business levels to influence the sort of demand for advanced manufacturing in different products and processes? Thanks, Hugh. Um, I feel, to an extent, I might have walked into the wrong uh, meeting room. Here. I, <laughs> You're in good hands. I'm it's in right. awe of my fellow <laughs> panellists. Um, yeah. Although I think, and, and as, a, as a private sector business leader, I'll speak quite openly, but I think one of the challenges uh, in, in Australia is that there, isn't, there is insufficient leverage of the significant acquisition spend. Fragmentation state by state, and even at a national level, unclear demand signals, uh, short-term fragmented acquisition that doesn't allow the private sector, it doesn't provide the private sector with sufficient clarity to make the investment decisions that we need to make in, in skills, in capital formation, and, and those kind of you things. You mean specifically in defence in this case? Well, no, actually, I mean, we're, we're partnered with a company uh, here called Nexport uh, in the zero emission vehicle space. And, okay. you know, um, buses, the, there's lots of grand statements about uh, the level of acquisition in, in, the, in the zero emission transport space uh, that is not then backed up by acquisition programs that run for 10 plus years to give industry certainty to invest. And, and sure, competition is absolutely fine, but certainty and longevity to those programs is, is, is a key factor that's missing. Is it realistic that each state builds trains? Is it realistic that each state builds buses? You know, it's not a large market and it's fragmented further than that. So I think there's a, a significant acquisition reform element at the state level and at federal level that would drive a much clearer and more sustainable demand signal in, in a lot of different industry segments and therefore allow companies like mine to make the sort of investments in the yeah. capital base that will ensure that we are competitive and competitive in a global context and not just, uh, not just uh, domestically. Um, on a more positive note, and, and obviously uh, the AMRF, and, and when we signed up as an MOU partner, uh, Hugh and I had this discussion, um, that our view was that it must be, the intent must be that it's a national capability with national yep. reach. Uh, and again, you know, we can't afford to dilute investment in R&D because there isn't a great deal of it here or applied research. So from our point of view, we operate in two states at the moment. We're looking to operate in a third and our market is global. Uh, so AMRF for us is a, is a lever that we can use domestically and more importantly, internationally as well. Okay, so acquisition, and I guess more generally procurement uh, certainty, yeah. A and investment in applied research and consistently yep. applied, but done so at, uh, with a national intent. So you have singular centers of excellence rather than multiple centers of excellence in a, in a small, small market. Yep. I'd agree with that, yeah. Sarah, from the place perspective, maybe? Yeah, well, you, you've picked it. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I think for us, our key role is to provide that, that common and shared platform mm. and to absolutely um, reiterate the Minister's point, who was with us earlier today. It is about building that confidence that government is committed to that. This incredible investment in not only the most recent commitment to $260 million for the Advanced Manufacturing Research Facility, a shared platform for, for businesses to use, um, but also over a billion dollars in Bradfield City Centre. Never in, in my career of, of working in global cities have I ever had an opportunity to build a city centre around advanced manufacturing, mm -hmm. one that really embraces it rather than pushes it to the back, back of, a, of an industrial estate somewhere. So for us, we're creating a platform, but we're also creating an incredibly important location for businesses you know, to attract talent uh, and to, to have that bump factor where they can come together, work together, share ideas, but also have secure locations. So for those who've seen our precinct plan, we have a very strong focus around national security, cyber security, uh, and also leading the way when it comes to environmental outcomes. So this is an aspirational location as, as much as one focused around advanced manufacturing. And I guess beyond the AMRF is the entire 
building, planning ecosystem which companies can move into around that. Absolutely, and what a great opportunity to use this as a testing ground for advanced manufacturing technique, but also then to um, bring in, you know, the discussion we were having just earlier, bring in the next generation of kids, whether it's around the NETM program that we're running that we heard about just before, or it is about raising the awareness and raising the appeal and attraction of, you know, these new and emerging industries and businesses. Yep. So, Tony, from a business point of view, and particularly given your background in public-private partnerships, uh, manufacturing, is that the right area for public-private partnerships and this sort of thing, and what should we be doing? It can, it can be and should be. Mm -hmm. uh, Roy, I, I think the I'm, I'm, I'm on a, a searching and learning mission now. Mm -hmm. So coming to this conference today and having a look at the exhibition downstairs is part of my education. And, of course, I've got Roy on the task force, so he's bringing incredible experience and wisdom from his experience overseas and domestically. So we are really in the mode now of talking to the industry to industry, and getting the feedback from small, medium and large as to what the government can do to encourage the development of modern manufacturing in New South Wales and, and what are the impediments that government may be imposing or inadvertently imposing, which are preventing the growth of modern manufacturing in New South Wales. So I'm on an education at the moment, but things like you've spoken about, procurement, for example, uh, Sarah, the great facility that's being built out at uh, out in Western Sydney in the Aerotropolis will have a, a tremendous impact and the feedback we've got from various smaller growth businesses as to how they could use a facility like that has been very impressive. What got me going on, on procurement was the Australian company, domestic New South Wales company, that came up with a rapid antigen test, took it to the federal government, said, we can make this here, we can do you know, hundreds of million of these. They said, no thanks, we'll buy them offshore. Mm -hmm. And they went to China. Wow. What could go wrong? Um, <laughs> anyway, they took it then to the US, Went and saw the US Department of Defence, who had a, a, a tender out. They got the contract, $300 million contract, manufacturing them in Maryland now, and 300, you know, 300 million US dollar contract, doing extremely well, and it's probably the biggest supplier in the United States now. So that's an example of procurement. Mm. And, you know, sort of, I'm, I'm pretty conservative fiscally. Um, so the concept of encouraging investment and growth through procurement rather than through grants, mm. which are a risk to the taxpayer. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do gra grants, and in some cases grants are the only answer, but through procurement, I think, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, look, if, you I... want, if you want hydrogen-powered vehicles, why not have them in your fleet? Why not have them in your bus fleet? Why not have them in your truck fleet? Why not have them in your automobile fleet? Just, it's a very simple process, and it encourages investment. Uh, you know, you are developing something like a rapid antigen test or whatever, and you've got a contract with the New South Wales government or the federal government or the Victorian government. You take that contract to financial backers, I'll give you the capital. Mm. That's as good as a bar of gold. Yep. Uh, that, that sort of thing. The other issue that's coming out in, with enormous clarity, of course, is the lack of skills. And, and I'm not talking about PhDs in engineering or science. I am, but going right down the line. Just machinists. Mm. Simple, you know, mach simple, to, well, simple ish task. I mean, being a machinist can be actually a very complex task. But just at the, the lowest possible level in technology, right to the top, we, as you, I can't, I can't lecture you about this, you know, all of you here know this. Massive shortage. And it's not a shortage that you can feel overnight. It's a shortage that we have to deal with immediately. Because we've got a magic opportunity now as the world comes out of the pandemic, the economy's picking up. We're almost like in a post-war environment. And if we look at post-war Australia, what got us going? Immigration. That was what fired us up. I mean, we had small, small workforce, small, small population. It was the immigration that inspired us and got the country going. And we're, we're facing the same challenge and opportunity today. Now, that doesn't mean also we shouldn't look after the long, longer term. You know, our education system, whether it be primary, secondary or tertiary, isn't producing the skills we need. Yep. And you all know that. 
So we've got to, we're going to head down to skills and things. Let me just unpack, if you don't mind, a little bit the procurement thing, because, I mean, yeah. many of us have heard examples like that. We now try and run what's called a, uh, an SBIR, Small yeah. Business Innovation Research Program, where the government has a problem, they want to procure, and you can put out a tender for a yeah. whole bunch of things. But even then, it's not clear we use our acquisition power to drive no. manufacturing capacity or, or any of these things. So what could we do to change that? Well, I think governments are going to have Policy to make some hard decisions. Mm -hmm. Outfits, you know, and that would mean direction to outfits like Procurement New South Wales. Yep. It was strictly dollar-based. Yep. The, in terms of value for money, they look strictly at, uh, am I getting this particular item at the cheapest possible price, rather than what's the long-term implications of developing a local capacity? And if we invest in this, we might we end up with better technology and... Might, might, we might have more secure supply lines. The yep. definition of value has to be changed in government yep. procurement. Yep. And that means keeping Treasury out of it, in my view. Yeah. <laughs> Is anybody from Treasury here? I used to be, it's OK. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> she's reformed. She's seen the light. She's come over to the light side. Yeah. I, mean, if, uh, I think Peter's you know, very keen to jump in on that one. But if I can um, also say, I think there's a really interesting opportunity we do have at the advanced... Um, manufacturing research facility because, you know, not only is it a building and, and, you know, and a concept that we've all been working on, but it is an entity that we're looking at how can we most effectively work with businesses. And the last thing I'd have to say is that we want to go out to tender each time on various different approaches. So um, we really need to look very honestly at this about how we set up an organisation around the AMRF that enables that and that really can leverage these incredible opportunities at the same time as, as achieving speed. And that's going to be an incredible um, challenge for us over the next 12 months or so. So we're all ears. That's why we've got to work closely with businesses and your good selves to understand how we can yep. make this happen. But I, I'm sure you've got a few ideas too. Uh, yeah, more, more than we've probably got time for. But just to pick up on a couple of things, I, I, to your point, Tony, unashamedly link early stage investment with cap capability and capacity build for outcomes. And the outcomes are delivered through the acquisition yep. cycle. Um, and just on that point about grants versus contracts, and it's something that I, I've talked a lot about in a lot of different forums, we're listed. An investor will value a grant one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. They will value a contract, yes. depending on what it is, mm -hmm. at 5, 10, 15, 20x the value of the... Software is usually the higher multiples, mm -hmm. but in our industry... You know, five to eight times the value of the contract is the value accretion they see in your business from that contract. That's incredible. Isn't it? Isn't it? And, and the grant... The, the Could you send us, can you send us that separately, please? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> We're putting case studies into the report. I, I, I'm a great believer in case studies because of my background in engineering and what have you, in technology. So, so let, me, let me continue in that vein into the second question because I, I mean, often say that... Genuinely, you know, there is a limited market for acquisition on shore. There always will be, particularly with state governments. And so anything in manufacturing genuinely has to be a global play. And a lot of that is driven effectively by productivity uh, and whether you can actually compete. And yeah. I know because I visited Quick Step, you know, the issue is how do you get that in a, in a productivity sense that you can genuinely market globally. And they, the, the directed question is productivity, key to supporting global competitors. What can we do to improve productivity in our manufacturing sector, you know, given that we are a high wage, we have to accept that we're a high wage environment, um, and we have to be part of that larger global supply chain. Mark? Yeah, so um, obviously we're somewhat biased. We're 90% export currently. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be doing, I think, quite a bit more work domestically, but I think we'll always be greater than 50% export. We operate in a global market. Uh, and we deliberately recruit people with a global mindset, which is not necessarily the easiest thing in Australia, actually. You know, that, that, the parochial nature of this market has great attributes. It drives in, enormous ingenuity and creativity, uh, but it also, it, it's difficult to sustain. You know, the, the, the US is very parochial, but it's also the world's largest market in almost every sector. Um, First off, in terms of the productivity challenge, or, or rather the competitiveness challenge, um, don't be self-defeating. Uh, yes, Australia has very high unit labour costs, but unit labour cost is not directly transferable into price. 
Um, and productivity is a feature. Value, as you said before, Tony, concentrating on value creation rather than just price is, is extremely important. Um, so I, and, and capital formation. You know, someone once told me uh, many years ago uh, in France, I think, that you can build anything, anywhere, competitively. The differentiator is capital formation, mm. right? Uh, and that goes back to my sort of like axe that I'm grinding around uh, demand signals because unless you've got clear demand signals that have got volume associated with them, investment becomes very difficult. International markets are, you know, vastly greater, but they're also at distance. They're hard to access from, a, from an Australian base. You wouldn't necessarily invest unless you'd won contracts internationally. But I think part of it's the psychology. You know, don't be self-defeating. We can be competitive. We prove it time and time again. Um, you must have a global mindset and you've got to, and this isn't about eliminating humans from the loop, uh, but you have to, the mantra I use at work is, is a warm body is your fifth on a list of five options, right? Everything else is about uh, systemization, automation. How can we do this in a way that doesn't involve adding to the labor force? Uh, and I think certainly in, in, a, in advanced manufacturing, um, we have to accept that the days of factories with 4,000 people in are gone, right? You know, you can produce the same output now with one-tenth of that workforce. Um, and that's not failure, that's success, right? I mean, and again, going back to some of the impediments, one of the challenges we have is um, government, uh, government support is almost always associated with job creation, which is absolutely fine. Yeah. But the multiples... Ha, ha, we're stuck in 80s psychology, right? You know, we're not going to create 400 jobs from this. We're going to create 14, but they are exceptionally good jobs. Mm. And we're going to make a lot of money that we're going to reinvest in the business in this country to do the next generation of, of, of technology and so on. And that's great. And, and the, the number 14 is a good number because the alternative would be zero, right? It's not 40 versus 14. It's zero for, versus 14. Yep. yep. Um, so a big, big mindset shift, I think, for, for a, lot of, a lot of people. Mm. Um, but, but, but we can do it. We can compete globally very successfully. Um, and, and the final point I'd make is, is uh, risk capital. I spent a couple of days in New York a couple of weeks ago, and gosh, what a different place. Um, and it is, of course, a different place in lots of different respects. But you know, if we think about not just government acquisition and its scale in this country, if you think about super... The, the national sovereign wealth fund that is super. Um, the extent to which that goes offshore um, rather than, than fueling growth domestically seems to me to just be illogical, right? That, you know, I, I'm not suggesting you just splash all that cash around because that would have obscene outcomes. Um, but, but there is a tendency to look yep. to overseas investment rather than domestic investment. Yep. Actually, I might repeat, because he's not here, Ben Kitchener, an anecdote I had from Ben Kitchener about, you know, how they kicked off at Sheffield originally, was they were looking at basically machining uh, landing gear for Boeing, uh, and then a clever little bit of R&D um, to reduce the vibration of the tool on the part, um, cut the manufacturing time from 50 hours to 8 hours, mm -hmm. and that's what got them going. Yeah. A clever bit of research, mm -hmm. um, good people, a few good people, you know, shifted the entire manufacturing operation to Sheffield. We, we've had some excellent examples of that uh, yep. during the day today, Hugh, you know, and you can only imagine how many more there are. Yep. So I think there's also that to bank into the productivity piece is yep. using some brains Smart. to do things better. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, Tony, uh, again, productivity. Uh, what can we do in this space? Well, I agree with everything Mark just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because that, that is coming out clear and Clear and loud. I mean, obviously, we are high, high labour cost country, but you know, things like automation and robotics are just so sensible. But even simple things like Roy's talking about just modifying a tool so it works far more accurately, far more quickly, and produces a better product is the sort of innovation that Australia's been famous mm. for in the past. Yeah. And that's something we've got really got to plug away at. Yeah. Sometimes it's some, something that can be quite basic that will improve productivity quite dramatically. A system. Yep. It's just a system. The, pro the process you're going through, the, st the steps in the process, 
all of those things you can fo you need to focus on in a high cost, labour cost cap. Well, I hope the AMRF will be driving that, which, you know, yeah. um, so let me stick to the questions. I apologise, I've gone <laughs> off track here. <laughs> Not with this panel, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, I just want to, I think I should like to come back to the AMRF and think about, um, Sarah, the opportunities. You've got that, you know, facility. You've now got the second building as well. You, yeah. uh, you know, we talk about driving productivity, driving engagement. How do you really see that working? Yeah, that's an, an enormous question with, with uh, many, many answers to it. I, I mean, I, I start as, as simple as our first building being a showcase of advanced manufacturing and and I was explaining um, earlier, in, in fact, to, to Mark around you know, the transparent nature of the building. So, you know, our next generation of school kids can come in and see these machines and understand it and their parents and, and can understand that there's an incredible industry and how exciting it is, you know, to, to be involved in here. So, you know, that, that really is, is starting to drive that right from the first building through to what I call, you know, the full AMRF, which will have not only a suite of incredible equipment, but I think for me, what I now realise the big game changer is, is the technicians and the, and the team around those machines to help businesses, but also to pull in research grants and to really, you know, um, push the, the thinking around how they're used and, and the equipment and really how you do take those prototypes through to commercial outcomes. And that, for me, is the game changer with the AMRF, if, if we can, you know, pull it off and get it to work in that way. But if I may um, just go back right up a thousand feet, you know, when in former role, you know, preparing a plan for, for the Greater Sydney area, there was a big push to rezone industrial lands to residential. And, you know, picking up on Mark's point, you know, everyone's saying, but the numbers of jobs in manufacturing is going down, you know, the, the industry is dying. You know, there's a real misconception around that and that correlation between jobs and productivity. And, you know, Harley and I were looking at a, a graph yesterday looking at, um, you know, profits and outcomes from these these businesses in the industry versus the, you know, reality of, of the job generation. And there is not a correlation um, like so many think there are. So, you know, thankfully we, we protected and, in fact, we doubled the amount of industrial land in the city um, around the airport in the last few years. Uh, and, and thankfully we did in light of everything that we've now seen in the last two years and the shift in our thinking around globalisation and, and the opportunities that we have. Um, so, I, you know, for me, of course, I would say this is as a, the city builder, but, you know, there's layers of elements within this. There's the physical, you know, there's the land that we need to provide, we need to service it. And so many of the businesses we've spoken here today, uh, you know, are just so keen to find the right sites, you know, for them uh, to expand and, and to attract new businesses. So there's got to be a big play within all of that, as well as the right equipment and the right people to make it happen. Yeah. No, we're all looking, genuinely looking forward to that, actually. Yeah. Particularly the semiconductor one, you know me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, got to throw that in. Oh, he's on semiconductors yeah, again. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to reference it. Absolutely. Make, your, your turn, Tony. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you know... Building an industry ecosystem around something like this, uh, what's the role of government and how does that dovetail into the, the open market? Well, I, 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 I think, well, firstly, the facility that they're building in the Western Parkland City is 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 fantastic example of what government can do. Mm. Uh, we had some people, you were there, mm. yeah. and you dragged me there, actually. Yeah, I did. Quantum <laughs> computing people. This is a quantum computing startup, and they said... They really couldn't afford the equipment and the facilities that you're building mm. if they had to pay for them themselves. They couldn't have raised the capital to do it. That's right. And and take the risk then that it doesn't work, you know, and you've got you've invested in all this kit. So you are actually giving them the opportunity to take the concept and develop it into a prototype because they actually couldn't afford it to do it themselves. Uh, that's spot on, but I think, you know, we don't want to fall into the trap that government does where we think we know better than those businesses yeah, and go right. buy the equipment that we think they need. So yeah. so that's where our partners are absolutely critical and that's the number we've yeah. been speaking to yep. today, yep. you know, guiding us on that, yep. on that journey. So I guess the government's role is to facilitate, intervene where there is market failure and there is market failure across industry in Australia intervene there, but do it, as you say, Sarah, in a way which listens to industry. Mm. In other words, don't interfere and say, oh, well, we're setting up a, a quantum computer, a government-owned company or something like that. That's not going to work. 
it's guaranteed not to work. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but you know, we can help in this. You can help in this area, sort of thing, getting it from industry. So I think it's it's in very it's vital that government listens closely to industry in whatever they do, and and that's. You know, in our report is one of the things we're trying to do is to find out from industry what can government do to help them, yep, and what impediments can the government eliminate to help them. That sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, which reminds me of what's it uh, Reagan's famous statement about the nine most worst or the worst nine words in the English language. I'm from government and I'm, I'm here, here to, to help. help you. <laughs> <laughs> I used to use that when I was in government and people didn't laugh. <laughs> I think it's funny. <laughs> Mark, uh, what, do you, what do you reckon? I'll, I'll, What's the I'll, relative role? I'll, Leaving I'll, aside the procurement piece. I yeah, yeah. I'll, well, I'll following on from that, I think um, that is a funny statement, obviously. Um, <laughs> but there are certain things that only government can do and there are certain things that only government should do. Mm. Um, you know, I, I was fascinated to listen to... Um, the CSIRO rep earlier and, and watched the video and, uh, and I was fortunate a few months ago to go to Parks mm -hmm. right? and that kind of promotion of all that's good that this country has done and can do is it's, it's vitally important I was, you know, I was really impressed with what you described before Sarah about the transparency of, of, of what you were doing like the physical transparency mm. because you know, I've, I've been to in, in the UK, the AMRC and the National Composite Centre, and I go in, I've been in the industry 25 years, and I invariably come out with two or three things where I went, wow, that's really awesome. That it is. Is. But it's the sort of awesome stuff that's done in a collaborative environment that isn't necessarily all shared, but it's, it's collaborated on to a point and then it spins off into something more commercially mm -hmm. confidential, uh, but facilitated, sparked, supported by... Um, a, 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 an academic and government base that wouldn't otherwise exist. Yeah. Um, and, and that, for me, is, is, is why, you know, why we, we, wanna, we sign up to participate in AMRF. We're really excited to see it come to fruition because there are many things. Government can bring industry collaborators together in a way that not many industries yeah. can. Um, you know, they're seen as a relatively fair and even hand. Mm -hmm. They don't demonstrate necessarily any bias towards one party or another. And, and they can create this kind of environment where, where that kind of collaborative research can take place and, and be really successful. Yeah. Um, and the promotion of it as well is, is vitally important. Mm. So I think there's, there's a lot of things that, that government does very well uh, and there's a lot of things that only government really can actually pull sure off. Do. Yeah. I agree. Should government, say at a state level, have more involvement in trying to get universities to work closer with companies in the manufacturing space? Or do you think that's just for industry and universities sort out themselves? Heaven knows. I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. I, I, I really struggle with, um, with the, you know, the academic landscape in, in Australia. That there is, it is, without question, there is world-class capability within the academic se sector, as evidenced by past achievements and, and as evidenced by what's going on now. But the pull-through, the commercial pull-through, and the collaboration between industry and, and the academic sector, whether government's directly involved in that or not, it's something I constantly rack yeah. my brains about. Unbelievably bad, isn't it? Yeah, it has been forever. Mm. This is not like a modern problem. This has been this has been going on forever. I've, I've worked overseas in Germany, in France, in Italy, and in, in the UK, and the collaboration is almost seamless yeah. between industry and academia. Seamless. But do we have the opportunity in something like the AMRF to change the mindset in that? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think it needs to be genuinely national. And, yes. and my point earlier yeah. about singular centres of excellence stops unhealthy competition, stops dilution. It does. And, and focuses the mind. You know, I think you said earlier, um, it can't be all things to all people and not everyone gets a prize, yeah. right? Uh, and that's totally okay. That's to in fact, it's imperative that that's what happens. Uh, so I think there is an opportunity, but it's, it, you know, you use Germany and the UK as examples. Fraunhofer, the catapult system in the UK, they're national endeavours that bind all of these organisations together. This is a state-level endeavour that we aspire to be in nationally significant. That's the way I see it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's an opportunity, but there's a long way to go. Can I jump in there? Because it, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the incredible interest, incredible activity that we are getting from the universities yeah. coming together. And it is a very different model to what we've seen. It isn't about real estate for yeah. them. It is about them coming together 
to work around this concept in this model. And so, you know, whilst I'm old school and I like to ground things with a building or a location or, a, you know, a, an identity in that regards, you know, this concept, this model, Peter's, you know, um, net and the education model, this is where we're starting to see them work together and, and increasingly working, you know, with businesses in these ways to achieve the outcome. So I think there's great hope. I think there's a heck of a long way to go with, with all of this. But, you know, um, we're literally and physically, you know, creating a, the platform for yeah, it. No, yep, through the Natan as well, which Absolutely. actually brings me to something like that. So I guess the other thing that comes to mind in this is the whole skills piece. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it's a big thing in the media now. Yeah. It wasn't a year ago in some sense. And in manufacturing particularly, you know, I think we struggle to, to genuinely get the skills that we could have uh, to encourage young people to really be involved in this, to show that, I guess, manufacturing's not really what it used to be. Mm. I spent a lot of time in biomanufacturing and other areas, and uh, uh, as well as semiconductor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Robots. Uh, you know, I do feel the things change. I mean, uh, in, that, in that sort of thing, what are the opportunities for um, really, again, yeah. using something like the AMRF to change the way that we do uh, skills? Well, I think talk about this, this glass building is fabulous. Yeah. Cause you'll have skills going through there, and you'll see people engaged in processes which are modern manufacturing, and the kids will see it. And their image of modern manufacturing of most people in Australia, who, other than those involved in it, is like two old codgers working on a lathe, you know, in an Ivis vest. You know, that's their image of manufacturing. Mm, it and it's wrong. It's totally wrong. I mean, some of it may be that, but that's not what's, what we're selling. Yeah. So and when you, your building will allow kids awesome. to watch it yep. And, get, and you know how excited they do get when they see something actually physically happening. Yep. That's what really triggers Absolutely. childish imagination. Yeah. So yeah. In, your, in your travels, talking to companies in your current role and chairing these task force, what's the feedback you've been getting from companies around skills and things like that? Well, what we have just talking about, they're finding it hard to attract and retain them. Uh, there's one, one aspect, and I've got to be careful here, but Australian companies as a whole are not not as strong as I find offshore, and you may agree or disagree with me on that, in that terms of development of their own people. We're not quite as focused on that, whether from simple things, simple things like apprenticeship right through. Mm -hmm. We're just not quite as focused on the development of our people, we're either through courses or through on-the-job training or what have you. There's also a gap there in Australia, in Australia's psyche, in my view, in business. I don't know whether you agree with that, Mark. I'd I do. <clears throat> it's precisely what I saw when I first arrived here, actually. That, yeah. Because um, the point I was going to make in, in this segment was actually that industry, uh, business has an enormous responsibility and role to play in this. You know, we, we invested in and built our own learning academy two years ago. Uh, and it's been great, but it's backed off against a really strong relationship with the local TAFE. Mm -hmm. And we're fortunate because of the aerodrome yeah. heritage that they've yeah. got some very relevant courseware. Um, and we've worked with state government and, and with two or three local schools that we're trying to turn into feeder schools. Uh, we've, we've had some help. I, I would like it to have been more coordinated on the, on the state government side, but we've had yeah. some help. But, but the skills challenge is fundamentally ours to solve, right? Mm. And, and I, I agree with you, Tony, that the mindset around we as an employer have a huge responsibility to the development of our own people is not something I see all the time. No, you don't. Um, and, and because you, we need to be part of the solution rather than the whinges that just identify yeah. what the problem is. Mm -hmm. I'm short of X. Government should provide me yeah. with X. Rather than I need X, I'm going to do something about it. Exactly. Um, I mean, again, just for, for those who benefited from uh, Peter's presentation around the NEDM, you know, for me, it is revolutionary in terms of flipping the model as Peter describes it, you know, and, and asking businesses what they need and then going to the providers to deliver. But if I can again take it up a thousand feet, I mean, fun fact, uh, our city is one of the fastest growing established cities in the world, you know, faster than London mm -hmm. and Paris and New York, you know, 3% per annum, it's phenomenal growth. Um, just behind some of the outskirts of, yep. of Melbourne. So we've got this incredibly, you know, strong growth. We've got a younger population in Western Sydney than other parts. Um, but as we all know, so many of them are travelling out of the city each day for work. 
Uh, and a lot of that is a misconception around the nature of work within Western Sydney and where their parents, who, who might be first or second you know, generation immigrants, you know, are aspiring mm. them to, to go and what type of professions they want mm. them to go into. We've got to raise awareness around it. We've got to make it more attractive, but also address some of the challenges we have in our communities around, you know, simple fact around, you know, fear or challenges of, of moving out of the Western Parkland City and knowing you're going to get back a certain time of day, you know, if you're yeah. catching public transport, providing the jobs close to home, uh, and then, you know, filling in the gap that we are, you know, increasingly hearing from businesses we're talking to between what they need and the next level of technology um, with the skills that we have in this incredible growing population. So what is such a strength of ours, you know, really that link needs to be made with the businesses and, and you know, our, our little pilot with Anetum is, is, you know, I think a, a first step in, in that one we want to grow out of Western Sydney but also talking to many people here today, we want to make sure we tie it into the schools and, you know, the ladies um, in the Reds point about, you know, yep, you, there's about three ladies left, but I've got you, I'm tracking you with that red top on. <laughs> Your point around awareness around a broader array of, of um, you know, uh, opportunities for work, I think is absolutely key. So, Nat, but Nat and there, I'm mean, keen to just follow up with Mark. Yep. It sounds like you do a lot of stuff in-house. Will, will things like Natum change that process for you a bit more? I hope so, because really what my fear is the, the work that we're doing, aside from the work that we do collaboratively with TAFE, is you end up becoming like an orphan organisation, right? And, yeah. and, and you go off and do your own thing and it suits you. But is that really developing your, your workforce? Mm. You, you want to integrate that into a bigger whole. Because, you know, a lot of what we do is job specific. But what about team leader training? You know, what about junior levels of leadership development? Or what about, um, you know, if we want to train someone on machine tools who's traditionally worked on, on composite fabrication? We don't do any machine tool training, so we've got to dip into something, a, a broader uh, skills base to allow us to tap into that. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that element of, 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 of the development out of Bradfield, I think, is... It, I think we're still trying to get our heads around it, but uh, but I think it could be really, really valuable. Yep. So let me just do one follow-up with us, with all of you here. So if there's one thing tomorrow you should get up in the morning and do to improve our ability to do manufacturing in the future, uh, not just in this state but in this country, I take the national point, what should we be doing? I think we should be selling it more widely and more broadly in our community. Right. I don't think the average Australian really, they just go to the shop and buy something. They don't really think about what's behind it, the supply line, what's involved. Yep. They're not terribly, they're, not, they're starting to worry now about the safety of supply lines and things like that. Yep. We've got to start playing really hard on that. Yep. Okay. Uh, I grew up post-war in Australia. We weren't self-sufficient. We nearly fell over and we became obsessed with self-sufficiency. Yep. But we've... That 40% of local manufacturers, what, dropped to 4% now. <laughs> yeah. We've sort of given up. But also... And now it's come back to bite us. Yeah. But, yeah, but also we need to be these days part of a global supply chain. We do, we do, yeah. Oh, we also need to be part of an Australian supply chain. Yeah. You don't hear Australia first. I mean, you know, I, I was talking to an outfit the other day that they manufacture one bit in Melbourne and they, the, the other bit in, in Sydney sort of thing. And, Combined, it's a great product, and they do that for reasons of efficiency and what have you. Yeah. So it's Australia first, really. Yeah. It, we, I mean, we go do get again. Uh, foreign investors say to me, "It's like working in seven. If you include OCT, it's like working in seven separate companies, mm. countries at times in mm. Australia. Mm. It's so confusing, yeah. and it's so silly too, which you wouldn't get in the United States, for example. Yeah." Sarah, what thing will you do tomorrow morning? Uh, well, I could, I could be really honest and say, uh, you oh. know, <laughs> no, I mean, there is an incredible, um, you know, spectrum of, of things that we're doing. But, you know, the honest truth is we're sitting down and we're designing the best damn AMRF that suits the needs of businesses in this city and we're putting it together in a development application and we're getting on with it. It's as, it's as simple as that. That's good to hear. Mark, one thing. I'll... It's not wanting to sound overly parochial, but it's, it's one thing that we're doing and have been doing for months now, and that's in, instilling a, willing, a winning mindset in our people. 
that we can compete, we do compete, and, and back ourselves because you know our ability to um, not wanted to wax lyrical, but you know there's immense mediocrity in our segment worldwide, and we are anything but mediocre. We're really good, but we have to believe that we're really good, and we have to sell value and not get confounded by price or scale. Yep, that's good. Yep. Well, one other thing we can all do, we've all got to push hard to ensure that mathematics is a compulsory subject in the HSC. Yeah. Okay? Yep. I had to do it. Everyone has yeah. to do it. <laughs> why, why should Sarah suffer on her own? <laughs> Absolutely. So I still do it, so there you go. Yeah. yeah. You still do it. Yeah, we've got to do that. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, I think we're done on the internal questions. Um,